Well, hello. Uh, we call this talk From Smart Cities to Cities That Flourish because the real question is if you're, if you're building intelligence and smarts and capacity into a city, to what end? And what this wor room is working on is really, I think, the leading edge of that. We have a great uh, group with us today. Uh, I'm Peter Hirschberg. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that I've done and how the world of uh, what we aim for in, in cities can increasingly focus on flourishing and wellness, how we measure that, how that can get built in. Joining me is Mickey McManus. He's an Autodesk fellow. Autodesk, you may know, builds a lot of the software that builds the built world. And so Autodesk is starting to think about how can buildings not just be literally concrete structures that don't change, but ones that learn, adapt, understand what creates well-being, and programs for more of that. In the course of that, Autodesk has also learned how, uh, how its systems can help the people who use it flourish. And Ting Jiang, who is uh, over to my further left, is with, for, is with the Center for Advanced Hindsight. Uh, they have done some of the best work in behavioral economics and asked the question, OK, if we're going to actually design these things, to what end? What's the objective function? What's the mechanisms we might use? So that's what we're going to talk about today. I should start by pointing out that it wasn't always the idea that cities pr should promote well-being. Uh, in, you know, there's a direct line between Dickens in the 1800s and New York City mid-century. Uh, cities were places where you toiled, where you worked. It was really with the coming of the information economy in New York, when John Lindsay called it Fun City, that we started thinking about how might cities actually be places of enjoyment and amazement. When Thomas Hoving started running the Parks Department for Lindsay in 1966, how could the city be a stage for, for for literally fun in the parks and happenings and things like that. Um, but there was a particular moment that the current smart city era started, which is based on mobility and technology. And that moment, of course, was September 7, 2006. This was the World Cup in Rome. It was France versus Italy. Telecom Italia partners with the MIT Sensible Cities Lab. And they're actually picking up texts from that game. There's overtime. There's a second overtime, and then Zidane hits the red flag, and the entire place erupts. You're seeing humans in flow and in this state of complete happiness picked up because they've detected the data. This was the beginning of the era that we realized that as complex as cities are, they're pouring out all sorts of data that are both telling us things, and then this raises the tantalizing question, well, if they're telling us things, how might we react? How might we program them, and what might we program? Um, and we see a number of interesting examples of that. Sandy Pentland at the Social Physics Group at MIT started realizing that you could just look at cell phone data, and if people were not coming out of an apartment building for a week, maybe that's where SARS was starting, and you could see public health weeks before it was a problem. Or cell phones can tell you about depression because people's patterns can change. So this was some of the early work that in one direction has gone off into great, uh, great examples of flourishing, but it's also led to a lot of the surveillance issues, which we'll get into today. Um, you know, if you want people to flourish in a city, you should get them involved in the city. When, you're, when you think that a city's happening to you and you don't have a sense of agency, you feel more remote. So one of the great movements here is here, citizens in Barcelona found it was too noisy. They couldn't sleep at night. And they complained to the city. The city's like, well, how do we know? So they deployed these Arduino noise sensors. The citizens <coughs> gathered the data, and the city literally changed the rules. So I, the citizens, and, you know, they were like, here's the decibels. and they, they well, It was interesting. I mean, this was some uh, teenagers, too. I mean, yeah. just saying, can we sense how noisy it is in our little square outside of our apartment? We can't sleep. And they were able to bring real data to, to the, to basically, to the government and say, no, really, we can't sleep. Look at this. And it led to a change. There's actually a notion in smart cities called rewrite urbanism. So when you think of smart cities, it's often done to you, top down. Uh, and there's open data sets. The city has data. Well, what if you want to have the damn data, right? So when we started doing that actually in San Francisco without any permission, we just started putting sensors up, writing the data. Of course, if you get this, the city has to take note, right? So this was, this was, uh, th this was data both about the built environment, but it's also about people taking control. Um, this, this, uh, this was from Helsinki about uh, 10 years ago or so. This was the first time that the power company created this kind of game. The more power you saved, the, the bigger and prettier that uh, laser projection was, right? So this was a feedback mechanism. It was basically turning the city into a game. Begins to suggest that the architecture, the architected environment can respond, not only some of the, like some of the stuff that, that Taizo showed us. Um, okay, well, what if you actually start programming the physical environment and you make changes in it? 
Can you make changes in it for well-being? So here's a project we did in San Francisco. You may know Market Street. A lot of people don't actually go out to Market Street to hang out. It's not like the West Village. It's just kind of like you get the bus. So the question is, what might you do about that? So we changed the city planning laws and put 40 temporary structures up from the foot of Market Street all the way down through Civic Center, through all sorts of different economic neighborhoods and, and, and backgrounds. And the idea was, if you, if you put in temporary activations, could you actually uh, measure for or test people being happier or behaving differently. Now this is important because normally a city would never let uh, essentially artists go mess with it. Like at Burning Man, yes, but not in a big city. But what gave us a clue that we could do this was in social media we had noticed that, that social media said to journalists anybody can make content and said to brands anyone can talk about it. So it occurred to us at, at Gray Area, which is an art technology organizations are, it occurred to us, well, maybe the city would do the same thing. They would realize if you crowdsource good ideas, you might respond. So this became Market Street prototyping. We did it twice. Um, there were about 50 projects. They were artists, students, uh, architecture types, uh, people from all walks of community. But what was interesting is when we put this stuff in, we noticed that people spent 700 times, 700% 700 more time in the street lingering or connecting with each other. You could actually instrument where people of different races talking to each other. Did, did kids come out more? And then when you did the second round of this, kids started telling their stories. So you, you actually could draw out in the built environment something that was better, something you'd only learned if you were prototyping it. Um, and, then, and then we measured it at the end. In fact, Ting and I were talking about the fact that when Gale Architects pro measured it, we didn't realize this is the same kind of information that can then go into a behavioral economics model. It, it's astounding to see how much more time people spent. Here was even a wellness experiment. Uh, if people arranged themselves the right way around a fountain, it would spurt, at, at which point people then learned they had to play a game and kind of interact with each other to get the thing to go, and that was a good example of something worked. So one of the interesting things here is this creates a connection between artists and even programmers and the city, and this suggests a form of agency. You know, in the 1960s, you would protest the establishment, but today you get to write to its API. We're talking about a world of increasingly, uh, increasing technology and robots. So one of the questions is, could you create a greater wellness state in this interaction? So much of the dialogue about robots is us versus them, where they take over or we're diminished. But actually, in this transhuman moment, what's the jazz between species? How can we learn from each other? So this is a project going on at Gray Area. And sir, if there's volume, we can listen to it. But basically, uh, here we're putting on exoskeletons. Normally, you put on an exoskeleton to help you lift something. But here, the exoskeleton is about to dance you. You're kind of giving up control to it, and it will tell you what you're going to be in. Now, the artist conceived of this as a pretty bleak story. But in fact, all of us who did it thought this, this was great. There was something about surrendering to it that put us in flow, reduced self-consciousness, created play. And this again shows that there are willful ways of working with the built environment that we're just at the beginning of. And, and what I find interesting about this, this particular moment is it is just the beginning. Uh, we suddenly have these technologies. It's important because America's rebuilding her cities right now. Our economy is, is such that development goes on in very few places to, to a great degree. This is the Opportunity Zone program. It's trying to put private capital into underprivileged areas. And the question is, if you're going to do something like that, what are you going to do? You'd need to plan. Um, and there are ways of planning. For example, at the MIT uh, City Sciences Lab, these Legos, as you move them around, change dynamics in a the city. They could change mobility, they could change third place. The idea here is, here's a set of things we'd like to achieve. Employment, third place, culture, uh, wellness. How do we actually dynamically plan a city and make the architecture change so that if we're not achieving that, we can achieve it? This plots uh, Kendall Square, a well-known innovation center, versus Harvard Square. You notice Kendall Square over-indexes on startups, because it's got a lot of incubators. But it completely under-indexes on culture, building efficiency, uh, fun, mobility, all that stuff. And what this says, if you're a city planner or you're a community, pick what you want. And then how do you dynamically change the environment so if you fail and you don't achieve that, your city, your architecture, even your zoning, your regulations can adapt and change. This is the adaptive world we're entering into. It's kind of where AI meets an objective function, meets a lot of experiments, and that's what kind of the rest of our panel will talk about today. Um, this can even get to the point that you can plan for wellness or externalities or reward uh, behavior like uh, 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 child raising or you know, live work or artistic behavior, actually put it into the economy there. To get this, 
what I would suggest is you need a framework. So often when people think about investing in cities or opportunity zones, they think about that first layer, it's real estate. It's where real estate money shows up. There's a whole data analytics and machine learning layer that can help us program it. That's what we're here to talk about today. Turns out there's a financial innovation and experimentation layer. Uh, all sorts of ways of changing ways we pay for things and inclusiveness leads to well-being. How can you keep more, more money in the system? How can you look at different ways of kind of making circular economies? Uh, possibly using new technologies like tokenomics and things like that. Maybe more people could earn through volunteerism the ability to, you know, actually buy into their, their house or actually own more of things. Gets into sustainability and also the notion of, of local economies. As you move away from the giant supply chain from China, how much stuff can you do locally that supports local businesses? And, and this stuff is being experimented with. Kind of geopolitically, you kind of have at a time of change, you have the populist reaction, which is very defensive and xenophobic, the socialist reaction, which is redistribute everything. There's something in here that I think can be manufactured that is, is actually nourishing and local, hooks up wellness, hooks up with the economy. So, and this, okay, here's the final point about this. I developed this framework for a, a private equity fund we have called Lighthouse, and whose thesis is you have to invest in all of these things, not just real estate. As I was writing it, I made it look like seven layers because I come from the networking and I was at Apple for many years running networking, so okay, the world is a seven layer diagram. I made one. I needed the seventh layer. And I'm like, a lot of people are talking about healthy communities. I should put a placeholder in. I'm like, I'm not sure if this is real or not, but it seems like a good idea. Then I run into Nicole at lunch and she's talking about this conference, like, can I show you my layer? That's where this whole conversation came from. It's like there's something there, indeed there is. Okay, so with that, I think we'll move on to our next speaker, Mickey McManus, who I have been partnering with on innovation things for years, and the work they're doing at Autodesk starts to take us deeply into this. Uh, and I, I think it's kind of interesting, hi everybody. Um, I think it's kind of interesting too that um, that, that top layer said well-being and health, you know, and I think there's a happiness component in there and, and a bunch of things. And I, I, we ended up um, becoming good friends with Ting as well, and, and um, what she's doing kind of almost really fills in that layer in some beautiful ways. So I'm pretty excited to share this. So um, in design, I started as a product designer, so you know, I would have a drafting table and a 30, 60, 90 triangle and a parallel rule, and I would draw products, and then I'd fight over bill of material, and I'd get them shipped and things like that. And what we noticed was CAD, computer-aided design, was mostly computer-aided drafting. All the ideas were here in my sketchbook, and then I went into this thing, and I tried to use robot arms to bend, you know, to draw curves and lines and blueprints and things like that. And a few years ago, we started investing on the research front in what if we could actually use generativity, machine learning, and almost um, team up with the silicon intelligences around us, so at least the silicon cognition. And this is what we ended up doing with generative design. It was this notion that what if we could just define the goals and constraints, the obstacles, and hit a button and have it kind of generate possibilities, like have a thousand interns spawned that could actually explore spaces. And so, so that's what we did. Here was the first ex one of the first experiments with physical spaces. We've been doing this for a while with, with products. Um, this is a, a facility in Toronto called Mars. It's right in the center of sort of where University of Toronto is and some medical centers. We were going to move our whole research team over there. So we instrumented the research team for two years in the old space because we were kind of curious about how did the environment work, what were the goals, what was going on. I'm going to show a video and I'll kind of talk over it to give you a sense of how it worked. This was an existing space, so it has some constraints. Um, and you can see it was a multiple layers, and we were curious about meeting spaces, social spaces, specialty spaces, and we also had about two years worth of studies where we actually interviewed everybody. And there were a few things like adjacency, work style preference buzz, we weren't sure how we were going to measure, and, and we started using all the lead sensors that were already put into the system to start thinking about it. And we defined where the columns were, those are obstacles, we defined what the goals were for the teams, they were trying to make sure they had social cohesion, and then we spawned 10,000 uh, architectural interns. And they started wandering independently. Some of them just fo focused on um, things like adjacency, and they, they looked at like where people were, where they were going to Outlook meetings. Another group of these virtual interns were actually thinking about um, uh, work style preferences. Some people wanted quiet spaces, some people wanted louder spaces. How could we put people in the, in the places they were looking for? We also set up a bunch of interns that had little headphones, virtual headphones and microphones, so we could listen to the things the other virtual interns were murmuring and saying. 
um, so that we could actually look at buzz levels and we could look at noise levels. Um, and then we know productivity is affected by things like sunlight and we know where Toronto is, so we decided to do things like cast the sun over the course of the year and be able to understand where daylight was so that we could actually get people more daylight. Um, and as these things were generating, we started actually sort of just over on, the, on, the, on, the, on your right, right side, we just set some objectives. The building manager had some objectives, the team manager had some objectives, some other people had some objectives, so we said, explore by giving us your objectives, and you set your dimensions that you care about. You're probably wrong, but as the AI starts generating lots of things, you can start playing with pairwise combinations. We could start looking at things like buzz versus daylight. We could look at productivity versus other things and help a human understand these millions of sketches that were starting to come out. And then over time, be able to say, where are the sweet spots? How can we navigate those different places and find multi-dimensional optimizations and, and explorations, which humans are not so great at multi-dimensional things. Like, we can keep about two or three variables in our head at one time. We have what's called bounded rationality. Um, but you could actually play with the machine to do this. And, and the machine would push back and we'd find out um, maybe, maybe that was a wrong dimension and we'd invent a new one. When we ultimately uh, built the, the building and moved in, we didn't turn this off. So this thing is still running live, striving towards its goals. And if the facility manager slides some sliders, I see they slide some sliders because I'm the team leader. If this goal was I move some chairs around at a certain level, it flags and says, hey, you said this was a goal. And then you could go check to see, did it really work? So that's the, that's the start of this idea of generative. And then we said, what if you could do that for a whole neighborhood? This is Van Wijnen. They're a, a contractor, building developer in the Netherlands. And we said, what if the owners of a, of a new community could own the backyard size, the space, the views? What if they could own the solar gain? What if we could build net zero communities and the, the builders could own the profit and the revenue and the city could own like the plan and the variety and the program and the zone? And what if you could kind of play together over this and ultimately look at multiple dimensions and then be able to do off-site manufacturing for the components so you can get a lot more people involved in building them and build, this, build these basically houses in three days now and they're all net zero. So we've reached a new objective function, and now this is a different way for the architects to think, where they're able to explore these dimensionalities. So that's what, what some of the communities look like. Uh, and then we said, what if we could actually apply this generative design idea to learning? What if we could set goals for our own career, goals for our own space, goals for the tools and mindsets we wanted to build? And so here's a little prototype that we're rolling out as a research plugin uh, next week uh, in a product design package called Fusion where we actually said, could you actually see how people were learning by doing what's called dynamic formative assessment? Right in the moment, I could see what you could do. So in this case, I'm building a pair of headphones. Um, the product is watching and it's going, wow, you just actually duplicated something, you mirrored something, you just did an extrusion, you assigned materials. Um, let's see what you learned. And actually flags, Bill, you just learned a bunch of stuff, but you've never de demonstrated CAM or simulation. Think about what a resume would look like if you could actually wind back the clock and see what people really know and also what they perform, how they explore, what their blind spots are. So this is basically helping each person have their own goals, generative design goals, for their own career and being able to wind through it. And then if I'm, I'm competing to hire somebody or to find somebody, I can scroll back and see out of the 1,400 commands that AutoCAD has, what do people really know and what do they love doing? So that was the notion of a, a sort of a city that learns. This is my own map, and my intern, who's been my boss for a few years, um, <laughs> basically said, I'm an exit level intern, um, said, I wonder how Mickey learned so much about sketching. You see that big section there that's about sketching. And so she said, I want to I wanna wind back and see, when did you learn about sketching? So she clicks on sketching, and she winds the clock back to see when I learned. And if you watch carefully, I learned like a, a massive amount right after April. And that was actually when I was starting to manage her. And it turns out um, that was kind of hard. So let's look at my cognition meter. I'm going to go click in and see what was going on with my brain. So let's go one step further. And I had some goals, like I had some bad habits. I would try to manage my, my intern boss, and then I would go find solace in social media. Um, and then I would bounce back and forth. <laughs> and it was very high consumption, so it was consuming a lot of my cognition. And it was very um, depletive of capacity. I only have so much in my brain to, to store every day. It's like a gas tank or a fuel cell that gets depleted gets depleted a lot if you use things like Facebook, because um, their job is to sort of strip mine your brain and sell it to somebody else, but we can't do that, right, <laughs> with products. So, sorry, Facebookers. Um, there are other things you do. I mean, there's nice, we can find solace in social media. Um, so, but then it also, I was able to look at some of the good things I was doing, and it turns out I was teaching these little mini speed challenges and sketching to some of the other um, exit level interns, then I was reflecting, and then I was napping. And then I was actually reading, and I found out over time that reading in the morning is really good for me. Reading in the afternoon, it's really hard for me to integrate. 
Um, so we don't have an FDA for cognition yet. I'm pretty sure we will. I'm pretty sure that the industrialists of this era are depleting our cognition, and it would really be nice if we could kind of reward people that actually build our cognitive capacity, help us actually build new muscles, and, and tax those that actually seem to be strip mining. Um, I think we'd have a very different dynamic about responsible technology if we thought about this. But we don't have an FDA yet. Um, I have hopes. Uh, and I'm trying to implement it within Autodesk and saying, actually, we need people to make better decisions. They're building most of the bridges, buildings, cities, cars, spaceships, video games in the world. It might be nice if we actually kind of rewarded them for having higher ethical capacity, more creativity and curiosity. Um, so this was sort of just a notional idea. We started prototyping. And then I bumped into Ting. And Ting is, is delivering this stuff. They're actually exploring how do you actually help people with the way our brains really work. Because she's been exploring a different category of how our brains work. I'm, I'm curious about this piece in the tool, but what about in life? So I want to hand it over to Ting. Thank you so much. Fascinating. <laughs> Fun stuff. So since we are talking about well-being, let's do a little self-checking here. Um, how many of you have exercised as much as you wish in the past week? Raise your hand. The past week, as yes. much as you wish. You as, as much as you wish. Ah, okay. How many of you have a daily habit of meditation? Just raise your hand. Oh, oh. The right conference for that one. <laughs> <laughs> how many of you have a daily nap of some 20 minutes or so? 20 minute nap every every, every day? day. Not too bad, but too I would bad. say five percent. Um, how many of you have um, connected? deeply with um, one of your loved ones in the past week for at least 30 minutes, uh, eyes to eyes. That's, sex doesn't count, okay? Um, oh, but your hands <laughs> are. Oh. Um, how many of you have connected uh, deeply, uh, sincerely, with a stranger in the past week during your commute? Or so? Not counting today? Not counting today. <laughs> See, I saw that. Okay. So um, how many of you are an organ donor? Raise your hand. Okay. Let me just give you a, a map of um, organ donors in Europe. And let's take a look at these differences. I think we're very good at explaining cultural differences. So if, if, if any of you can tell me, why is Belgium almost 100% organ donors? And the Netherlands, which is a very similar country, although they would deny it, um, <laughs> has, uh, you know. 2.8%, oh, 28%, right? And similarly for Germany and France, drastic differences, right? What's why? Okay, a lot of you know about this, but one interesting fact about uh, when people were asked why they were organ donor versus not, guess what are the answers for those who are organ donor? They say, I care about saving lives. Um, what about those who are not? They say, well, think about the doctor who sees me with all the good organs, you know? Um, they might not try to uh, save as, you know, try as hard to save my life if they can save, you know, six other patients. Now, those were the rationalization. How much do we realize that it's the form? That we just don't like to tick boxes and don't want to take, you know, responsibility for, you know, decisions that we don't have much time to think about? Very little, right? We also so. have these weird feelings about future regret. <laughs> that we really, if we check that and the doctor really does piece me out into parts, <laughs> what would have happened? So, but, but what I love yeah. about this, this point, though, in this is that um, we tell ourselves a different story than what really happened. We tell ourselves we're, we're just more ethical. Um, but that's an environment. The form is an environment. You check it. It's an outside thing that's shaping you. And I think that's why we, we think this is really interesting. How much of our yeah. daily lives is, is shaped by outside things? Uh, a lot. A lot. We'll see. Yeah. Um, right. So, indeed. So, so, understanding the problem before creating the solution. And who says this? Einstein. Okay. So, top ten causes of death. These are two panels. Um, one is from a developing country, one developed. Which one do you think is from Europe? Which one from Africa? Maybe not too difficult to guess. Yeah. Right? And what's the, what's the pattern? is that we are getting better and better at killing ourselves. We don't die from murders anymore, from, in, um, in, from uh, communal diseases, but we die from heart, heart attacks, you know, um, cancer. A lot of these illnesses that can be prevented effectively from lifestyle. If we look at the data for heart, heart diseases, 
um, for a healthy subject, lifestyle is four times as effective in preventing these illnesses. And for even those who have these problems, um, reduction um, is of, of the problem is twice as effective if you go for lifestyle. And what's the cost of bringing a drug to the market? Too much. The question is like, okay, the solution is simple. Let's just do some behavioral change. What's the fuss about it? Why don't we do that? Do we understand that it's not a good idea to do all of these wonderful things? We make New Year resolutions every year. And halfway, you know, three months down the road, we fail, but we still make them. There's a fundamental problem of us, ourselves, and the governors and whoever, uh, who, who are trying to design our environment, not realizing, one, we're really bad at our behavior and decision making at the moment, and that these are decisions are really as simple as these daily decisions, but they're also not fully under our con in our control. We need the choice architecture. We need our environment to be supporting all of these healthy habits, and they're not currently designed um, in our favor. Okay. So um, because of this misunderstanding, I think we have so many interventions going for, you know, motivating people, trying to address the lack of intention, right? And, and, and we're just, you know, over-attributing a lot of decisions to, to intentional um, processes, and we forget about there's such a thing called intention behavior gap. It's that we have, we know exactly what's the right thing to do when we are under cognitive constraints, as, um, you know, uh, Mickey pointed out, um, and the world is, you know, getting over, uh, increasingly more and more um, um, challenging in, in information uh, lo overload, um, we really simply don't have as much cognitive uh, power to, to make this uh, decision right. And, and because most daily decisions are now habitual, and um, so if we think about this, um, it's not just trivial decisions that are impacted by it. So this is a pattern of judges letting prisoners get out on parole, and here's the pattern. As you go by the day, um, it peaks at 10 a.m. break and lunch break. Why? Well, they actually put more people back in prison, right? This is about they won't, yeah. they won't let people go. Are they worse people right before lunch? <laughs> <laughs> As we are tired, we, we don't like to take, you know, risk. So, you know, that, that's as much how, how, how impactful it is. So we're less rational than we think, but really our irrationality is also more predictable than we think because we have these two systems and then the automatic part and the deliberative part, and we're just over-attributing a lot of the decision um, to the deliberative part, and in fact, we're just autopiloting a lot of the times, and we need the cities, we need the environment, we need the space around us to really support it. Um, so now, let's talk about choice architecture. Um, we know all of these uh, biases, and we also know the tricks to adjust the biases, so there's one trick called reward substitution. How does it work? You try to get them to do the right thing for the wrong reason. Let me give you an example. If you want gentlemen to target well and not to have spillage, right, don't tell them what's the right thing to do. And don't say, hey, it's important that you don't pee on the floor. Don't say that, right? Maybe you can use tech, you know, as we see from a lot of speakers, you know, great. Um, there is a P. Jimi Hendrix out there somewhere. <laughs> We're looking for him. But the, as it turns out, such a simple method, just putting a little fly picture, right? You can already get them to target. It's already gamification. It's already getting the right mechanism. Those are not real flies. They have good health <laughs> systems, though. Right. So the Dutch airport, uh, the head of the airport said that this reduces spillage by 80%, they claim. Um, so, so I think you know, it's really important um, that we, uh, one, get at um, really scientific diagnosis of well-being factors, the reason why I'm asking a lot of these questions. It turns out that we really sometimes don't know what we need. So there's an um, uh, interesting experiment um, uh, giving people $10 and ask them to spend either on others or on themselves or by Mike Norton. It turns out that people really uh, enjoy more when they spend the money on other people. But if you ask people, you know, what is a better idea and what will other people do? They would all say you're spending it on the, yourself. Um, if you ask people, hey, during commute, uh, would you be happier talking to a stranger versus just, you know, staying quiet? And they even do the exact experiment. And it turned out that 
people really are better off talking to a stranger and connecting with others, uh, but they do, do not think so themselves, right? So do we really understand our own sort of well-being, you know, obstacles? Um, uh, so if we think about how to design a workplace, the dream office that you ne never want to leave the job because of the office, and, um, and, and if you think about the factors, one, there's one single factor that's so helpful for productivity and mood and everything, it's napping, right? And how many workplaces do we have nap facilities? <laughs> Not a lot, but maybe some. You know, tech companies have that. But is this the most scientific way to get people to nap yet? Not necessarily, right? We know out of sight is out of mind. We know that there is also social image in place. So providing the facilities, you know, there's the open defecation problem. Uh, it, for a long time, you know, um, the, the UN has been sending toilets all over the world to see the thing that they, that would solve the problem. But then nobody used the toilet. They use it to put things, you know. You're not changing the behavior by just providing, you know, um, that. So, um, so anyway, so this is maybe a better idea when you really get them to do it. Uh, and the other is what's, you know, experimentation, rigorous experimentation iteration. I think Peter is doing a lot of that, which is really great. Um, and, and lastly, let me just say intention behavior gap. So we all know that um, it's great that we can put in some of these interventions into place, but how easy is it to do this? So last year we got um, one week before Christmas, um, the architecture company that we were working with have this amazing you know, place built and they say, hey, can you guys just put in some well-being interventions here? After they were almost done with everything. So the only thing I managed to put in is uh, collective biking, you know, with, um, you know, triggering the fountain, similar to Peter's idea, but not much else, right? But what we really want is really something that we can start from the very beginning, making a right diagnosis of what are the factors, what are the ideal behaviors that we don't think is necessary, it's not urgent, but it's crucial for driving well-being. It needs to be there as the design goes from the very beginning. Then tweak it. Here I have a twin city design where you have an experimental district and a control district looking exactly the same, except that you're tweaking you know, um, the, the, the things that you think is most effective. Um, and lastly, how we bridge intention behavior gap for our clients. Um, so this is something that we tell people um, that uh, well-being can actually get you uh, performance and uh, money. So here's a new fund uh, that use well-being factors as the indicators to invest, to pick companies to invest in. And these are all the black lines, black, uh, and the S&P 500 is the orange one. The so black it performs well-being factors in yes. the company. Yes. Well-being factors in the, the financial side. So it's 12 percent better than the <laughs> S&P 500. And can you guess? Which of the two factors are the one kind of really uh, on top out of these four? Which ones are the better performing ones to use for, for buying stock? Any guesses? Special recognition, raise your hand. Clear expectations, raise your hand. Training, raise your hand. Honest mistakes, value. Okay. Um, half right, right? So it turns out, yeah, so the one underlines the one working better. Um, and it was founded by Dan, and he used uh, the data from one of his earlier research when he collected the data. So it turns he's out. He's making money with yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, he's thank, definitely thank making you, money. And Miss, Mickey, I think <laughs> okay. we're about out of town. I want to thank Nicole for the opportunity to, uh, to put all this together. Uh, I, I think what's interesting, but the great thing about your story with China there at the end is that what, what's going on with well-being now is exactly what happened with kind of user, user interface and good design early on in computing. It was like, they call you in the last minute and say, we finished the software, make it look good. And you're like, no, no, you have to start that way. <laughs> and we're now at the point where we can instrument, we have the theory and the economics, and yeah. we now have the ability to change the built environment. Make some of those dimensions that are part of the generative dimensions, well-being, happiness, and others. Yeah. That, the, that the ideas that this conference are about it can be built into the cities, can create profitability, and, and that's kind of the mandate we get to go forward with. So I want to thank you all. And uh, this stuff's at the beginning. We look forward to great collaborations. Thank you.